by now I bet you're really excited about the opportunity for running experiments online. And so now let's dive into some general principles for getting this to work effectively. The first principle is that ultimately you want to run experiments with an equal number of people in each of the two conditions. I emphasize this because some guidelines suggest running only a small number of people in your treatment condition for the reason that it may be a bad or crazy idea and so you only want to expose a few people to the crazy idea before you make it go. The reason that you want to get ultimately to having an equal number of people in each condition is it's the fastest way to be able to detect an effect if your design is causing a change that matters. However, you don't want to start out at 50-50 initially. What you want to do initially is ramp things up. And the reason for that is your design may be disastrous. Usually if you see a big change in the first few people, it's a negative one. And that's going to be because of software bugs or other just things that you didn't think of, problems that happen. And so rather than expose it to half the population initially, try out with a small sample looking primarily for a negative effect. If you don't see a major negative effect, then you can dial up the fraction that you assign to and slowly get to 50-50 from there. And if you do see a negative effect, automatically abort your experiment and try to figure out what went wrong before continuing. If you want to be fancy, you can even do this in software. The hardest part about doing online experimentation is figuring out what you want to measure. There's a story about a person who comes across a drunk man looking for his keys under a lamppost. And he asks the drunk man, what are you, what are you doing looking for your keys under your lamppost? Uh, and the drunk man says, well, you know, my keys aren't here, but it's where the light is, so this is where I'm looking. It's easy with experiments to be like the drunk in the lamppost, where you run experiments only on things that are easy to measure rather than things that matter. And I think that while experimentation is a tremendously powerful tool, you want to make sure to point it at the things that matter. And often the creativity that that requires is figuring out how to meaningfully measure the things that you care about. It's also important to run your experiment for long enough to, for people to get accustomed to it. If you have a change in the user interface where you move content from one place to another or think of a new way of presenting information, it may take a while for people to get accustomed to it. And for that reason, you want to make sure that you run it for long enough that if you see negative behavior early, it's not just that people are unfamiliar, which can happen on the first use. You want to give things enough time that if you're seeing a positive or negative change, it's something that's going to be durable and that you can trust. There are three key rules for random assignment. The first one is that your assignment should be consistent. The same person should see the same interface every single time they log on. That connects with our principle about running things for long enough so that people can get used to them. And it also means that you're not seeing people who come to believe that your interface is completely unpredictable. If they see the same thing every time, then your measurement is going to be a lot more meaningful. It's also critical that your assignment be truly and completely random, that the odds of somebody ending up in one condition are completely identical. And that means, for example, that if you run two different versions, you don't want to run one first and the other one second. You'll want to run both at the same time in parallel and do random assignment on simultaneous versions that are available. This helps you avoid problems like one day of the week having different behavior than another day of the week. And while there's tremendous power in running online experiments, there are some things that it's important to caution about. The first is that by running these controlled experiments, you really can be sure that it's your manipulation that's causing the change in the behavior. But theory building, trying to figure out what to generalize from that result, is still difficult. Behavior can be finicky and predicated on subtle but meaningful factors. One thing that can help is to use multiple methods together. And one reason that we teach a broad variety of user-centered design techniques in this class is I often think that by combining them, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. 
so you can run online tests to get statistical significance and sample a broad population and combine those with in-person studies where you can see what people are actually doing and ask them when you see changes in behavior. I wanted to conclude by talking about the role of the designer in the online age. It used to be the case that the role of the designer was to make one great thing. In the online world, it's about creating several alternatives that you can then compare and experiment with. And this comparison is really important because it's easy to be too sure of ourselves. Oh, that can't work, or this has to be good. Trying things out gives you a lot of power. And these trials can happen sooner than you might think. If you do this carefully and well, Rapid experimentation can help you fail fast to succeed sooner.